The Mir holds his court every now and again, and it is an open court. Anyone can come and listen and attend. He is the supreme commander, he is the supreme judge, he is the king, and he is the father of his people. Children also come and sit in the court when they are doing nothing else and attend what goes on. The country is run by the Quran members of the jury sitting on both sides. As a man pleading his case, these cases refer to land and property. There is hardly any crime in this part of the world. There are no lawyers either. The justice is swift and immediate. The members of the court jury give their opinion. The man with the white bear is the prime minister and you see him later on also taking part in many activities. Some litigants are very vocal. This is one of them. A very happy state and the Mir knows what goes on in his domain. Incidentally, in this court there is no Fifth Amendment either. The elders form the members of the jury. Sometime a written document is also produced as evidence, which is read out. There's a tremendous enthusiasm for schools in this area. More and new schools are open every day. There are no buildings for it in many cases, and the school is held in an open space. The education is free. There's one teacher for all. So he just divides them into different grades and different groups. This boy doesn't seem to, he's done his homework. The boy with the coat is the son of the Mir, and a very fine horseman too, a fine lad, who took great interest in the expedition. Polo originated in this part of the world, and here's a polo team going to the polo field. They play polo in its ancient form, and thousands of villagers come for the Harvest Festival in great processions with bands and flags and polo sticks and horses and shouting and yelling and music going on all the time. Every village has a polo team and the band of course is always in attendance and all, at all these functions and as usual children standing behind watching the fun. They wear fancy clothes too for the occasion the Mir is the host for everyone. He feeds them for these two, two days, and the food is centrally cooked. A yak is slaughtered every day, and everybody is Mir's guest for these days. No one goes hungry. There's plenty for everyone. The Prime Minister supervises the distribution of food. The girls watch the fun from the top of the ridge, and they get a wonderful commanding view. The polo match is in full swing. The main street of the village is converted into polo field, and it's free for all. If you miss the ball, you can hit the pony, and you miss the pony, you can hit the riders. And for our sake, the score was put in English on a blackboard 
which was taken from the school. You can even pick up the ball and run with it, but there's a danger of receiving some polo hits, hits on the head. Archery from a galloping horse is another popular sport in this part of the world. There's a white marker to be shot at. There's a meal coming himself. He's almost got it. The Prime Minister now has a turn at it. They say it's good for the drums to be warmed up. Produces apparently better music. Tent pegging is another event. Here's the meat coming now, with a lance in his hand, and a small peg which is buried in the ground, and it is to be picked up from a galloping horse. And he's picked, he's got his peg. This man got his one too. Different types of drums, you see. And now the inevitable dancing. You will notice that the dancers are all men. And different dances will be performed by different people. And the Prime Minister again taking part in one of them, wearing a rather handsome coat. Some are slow and some are fast and some are solo and some are many join. Sword dance is the next event. It is very popular and these are real swords and pretty sharp. But these men are expert at handling these. And it's not one sword but two swords with which they dance. One in each hand. The children love these shows. The schools are closed. Because these children expect to be, to do these things themselves when they grow up. Here's our friend, the Prime Minister, again. He's pretty old, but he doesn't know how old he is. But he's in fine state of health. There are no birth certificates maintained, so it's difficult to know the age of a man. He can only guess. It's a pretty rugged country, but you see terraced fields all over the place. And the Hunza River cutting through on the way to join the Gilgit River near Gilgit. 
This is the most common type of bridge made of rope. And the rope is made from branches of trees intertwined. Consists of three parts, one on which you walk and one on either side for the hands to hold. And it can take hardly two men at a time. We asked them how often they renew the bridge and the answer was when it breaks. They last, I believe, a season. It's not very easy to walk across this type of bridge. The expedition is now on its way to the mountain. And this is the first stage of it, having crossed the bridge on the way to Joglod, which was the first village. We had about 60 coolies, but we are going higher and higher now. crossing these streams on the way with cold, icy cold, rushing water. Many of these men would bring their burrow for carrying loads in addition to what he carries himself. We were going higher and higher now And there were 60 coolies to carry the load of the expedition. Wild flowers were in full blossom at this time of the year. And we are now almost reaching the end of the tree line. having done, climbed about 10,000 feet. The track is like a goat track, very narrow, steep, and going uphill all the time. We have passed Joglot village, which is the last big village, and now entering Darbar, where we camp for the night. And this is before getting to the base camp. There are no more villages now. And this is the first base camp which the expedition established. About 12,000 feet high. In the distance is the glacier, rising towards Rakaposhi. We were fortunate to find a plateau like this with a stream running through where the tents were pitched and the baggage was sorted out. The coolies were sent back home, and the porters who were to stay with us started the work on their own. We were fortunate in finding a Hunza who said he was a cook. It took him some time to, to know what cooking was, but I must say that he was extremely intelligent, and no time he became pretty efficient in cooking most of the things that were needed. Making a chapati, which is like a pancake, There were six porters. Two of them had been with the German expedition before and knew something about, about a high altitude. The rest came for the first time, but 
it wasn't very difficult for them to get climatized and climb Kenchinchanga. We decided to change the base camp and make a different approach. And so we shifted to another place, and this is the second base camp, which was 14,000 feet high. We had a stream running through the camp where water started flowing at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When you are on a mountain, there's hardly any privacy between the members. George Band getting a haircut from David Fisher. Incidentally, he's one of the finest climbers in the world, having climbed Everest, Kinchinchanga, and many other peaks. The doctor is a very busy man. He happened to be leader also. And there's always a tremendous number of people who come to the doctor for help. The villagers were always coming, every day coming, to ask for medicine and kept him pretty busy. Having established base camp, we moved to Camp 1, which was 15,000 feet high. The mountains in this part of the world are quite different from anywhere else. They rise steep. See our porters, still carrying a lot of baggage to Camp 1. We pass a tree line We kept a few coolies to help us to Camp 1, which wasn't very far This is now moving to Camp 2, 17,000 feet high. A rope had to be fixed to make it easier, especially for the porters. This was a, at the end of a gully, and there was always rocks coming down, which made it rather dangerous. Camp 3 was established about 19,000 feet high. The snow was deep. And you can see the result of it that was pretty hard going. There are two members in the distance, nearing the top, who gone ahead. Zirakaposhi in the distance, to the right is the monk's head, which was our next objective. There wasn't much room for camps on them at this place, but we were able to flatten out a piece of ground and make a dump of stores.
from camp to we were able to get some wonderful view. As moving from camp three to camp four, which was about 19,000 feet, and going around a cornice. This is where the expedition met its first misfortune, Rangam and one other porter, as they were going over a cornice, having gone there before, the day before, they met a disaster. The cornice broke and Rangam fell down about 60 feet and he had to be retrieved later on with the help of the others when they arrived. But this put him and the porter out of action. They had to be evacuated all the way back to the base camp. In the distance is Monk's head. We're trying to get there to establish camp four and five. By this time, the members are getting tired and weary. For the hard going, and strenuous work involved. With Rangam and two porters having gone, we had another unfortunate episode now that the bad weather started. and it lasted several days, which forced us to abandon the peak and come back. But the expedition achieved one thing, that they climbed highest than any other expedition before and found a route which is possible to get to Rakapochi. And there is a mountain still unclimbed. There is one thing which is outstanding about Rakaposhi, that it is a gentleman mountain. It has never taken life of the climbers that have attempted to climb it.